Back on Morning Line, thanks for joining us. Getting some new information here before we're joined by our next guest. As I said, nothing is definitive set in stone, but there's more information coming out with regard to the stimulus plan. I'm checking on it right now. The one group that I told you may be excluded at this point may actually be included. The, those on SSI benefits. Uh, our understanding from one report is that um, you know it will include checks for those that uh, are on non-taxable means tested benefit programs such as SSI. So the way this story is evolving today is that it appears as though there may be a good chance that actually everyone on any type of social security benefit, whether it's social security disability or SSI, will get a check. And again, I apologize for the going back and forth on this. This is because so many people are asking. There are those in DC filing these reports out of what the basics are, but it appears as though it may be more expansive. And this could be because more changes have been made over the past 24 hours to include more, which is good news. Bottom line on this, everyone's asking, we're trying to give you answers, but we should know for sure sometime within the next 48 hours. And my take is it looks as though at least 90% of the American public will get some kind of check. All right, let's uh, join now uh, our guest uh, on Skype, John Viles, political science professor at MTSU. Good morning, Professor Vile. Good morning, how are you? Good, it's nice to have you this morning. And uh, the, the questions I'm getting right now a lot are about the stimulus plan, it's moving about. I wanted to ask you about that first. Uh, you know, there, there was a snag yesterday, they finally worked it out and overnight. Did you see, I think was the vote 96 to nothing? When's the last time we saw a vote like that? It's been a while. It, it, pro it may have helped that uh, one of the senators who might have voted against it was was on a coronavirus <laughs> lockdown. <laughs> well, I'll tell you that, and again, this was in the Senate, like you said, passed 96 to nothing. Now it goes to the uh, the House of Representatives, and would you say that uh, that's pretty much what they should be able to get passed with a voice vote, and there's little doubt the president will sign it? That seems to be the case, yes. A voice vote means that not everybody has, you know, you, well, it'll save time and not everybody has to be there if, if they're contagious. So that, that's the wise way to proceed. Let me ask you in the larger picture here with the coronavirus and, and, and what's happening. Well, I think all politicians, including the president and state lawmakers and down to the local level, all of them have a grave concern over the health of the public. I, I, do, would you agree that at some level, all of them somewhere in the back of their mind are considering how their actions play out politically, especially in a presidential election year? Absolutely. I think one of the things you've noticed um, is almost every day now, about the time that most people, if they were going to watch the news, would switch on to the news, you've had uh, press conferences that have lasted or briefings that have lasted sometimes upward of an hour or so, and they almost always feature, you know, President Trump. And the same is, is true at the state level. Uh, Governor Cuomo certainly in New York has gotten some publicity. And occasionally you'll find a figure who gets publicity sort of on the other side, like the Texas Lieutenant Governor who basically said, uh, you, you know, time to get the economy start, started back up again. Let's not worry too much about it. So what do you think as we see this move forward? I mean, I'm intrigued on a lot of levels how this coronavirus is going to affect if nothing else, and hopefully by then things will ease up considerably, but you wonder through some of these primaries the way it played out, uh, especially on the Democratic side, I mean, voter turnout, uh, how will this affect the election? I mean, what, what as you look ahead are, are the real issues here when it comes to a presidential election against the backdrop of this coronavirus? Well, of course, it's already affected some elections. Ohio is an example of a state, as is Louisiana. Uh, that have, not, I don't think they've canceled, they postponed the primary elections. Um, you know, at this point, it looks like, you, you know, Trump has had no opposition really on the Republican side to speak of, and it looks like Biden is sort of the comeback kid of the, of, of the, the election, though, though he was down for the first primary and caucus or two. He rebounded after South Carolina. Looks like he pretty much has a lock on the nomination. So I don't think we have too much to worry about until November. Uh, one would hope that much of this would be uh, over by then, but certainly it, it would not be unusual if states expanded uh, early voting, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, this has happened in many of the primaries that we've already had. I, I should say that the one problem with that, depending on whether they do it by, you know, my mail or how long it takes to get in, if we had a very close presidential race in the Electoral College, we could be waiting a couple weeks in some states uh, to, you know, tally all the ballots that have come in through these various mechanisms. So that's that's a possible effect. As far as the effect on the candidates, um, I'm intrigued. Certainly the president, you know, for the first three years of his presidency, he didn't spend much time in the press room, did he? And uh, of late, of course, he's there and, uh, you know, with a staff of folks there answering questions about the coronavirus. Um, from his perspective, okay. You are uh, rarely, by the way, space the way they ought to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, yeah. you, you're, you're following good policies this morning, and I appreciate it. Yeah, exactly. So w with regard to him, and, and I thought I saw some polling numbers this morning just in terms of approval rating on how he's handling the coronavirus. And, and like you might expect, it goes up and down, and most currently it's up a bit. Uh, I think people appreciate the, uh, the stimulus plan and the role he's played in that. Um, you know, I, I'm just curious that we've never in human history, or rather U.S. Uh, presidential history, had something like this happened before a race you know how, how are you convinced one way or the other this and how he handles it, it's going to help or hurt him absolutely I mean the, the the primary strength that this gives him is it gives him an opportunity to show leadership in a time of crisis you know he's now calling himself a war president and uh, some in the audience may remember when uh, FDR moved from, you know, Mr. New Deal to Mr. War. And, uh, you know, war president always, always sounds a, a little bit better. But the other thing that we need to watch here is the two primary criteria by which Trump has touted his own accomplishments have been rise in the stock market and low unemployment. And clearly, you know, at the present time, both of those, neither of those is a particularly uh, good good measure. Now, again, he may be able to say, you know, certainly coronavirus is not unique to the United States, and he may be able to say, well, we're, you know, we're handling it as well as anyone else. Uh, his, his primary method of operation right now seems to be to sort of downplay the significance of what's happening. And, you know, there's a certain reason to, you know, to, we always like presidents who are optimistic. On the other hand, we need to make sure that he's not, you know, giving giving the okay to people to be out and, and, and about when it's too early to do that. Yeah, that's that's the interesting case here. You're, there's no doubt about it. It's bothered him as he's seen the markets fall and the unemployment you know rate rise. Again, though, I mean, this coronavirus is not his fault. People may decide whether or not you know the, the government reacted quickly enough to it, but it, you can't really blame him right. for that. But if he does do, as you've heard, like, well, what about Easter Sunday? Let's maybe target that. Right. And if he were to do that and be optimistic and things work out, then I think that could be huge. If he does that and people who follow his lead stop social distancing and we all of a sudden had have a huge spike in the pandemic and more people die, I mean, that could be a real problem for him politically, I would think. They'd say, why did you say this? And we're out here. So it, I think it can cut either way and yeah. we just don't know how it'll play out. I agree. One, one of the fascinating things yesterday was there was a poll out that sort of charted you know, Democrats and Republicans, about 51%, if I remember, Republicans thought the coronavirus was significant. That 86, 87% of Democrats did. So you had a 35% gap or so between those two groups. And apparently, Republicans are less likely right now, or, you know, if you're a strong Trump supporter, you're less likely probably to take coronavirus seriously uh, than others. Though I may, you know, surely need to say that although originally Trump was saying this was basically a hoax, he seems to have backed away from that. Yeah, that was early on as he learned more. I mean, and that's interesting, those numbers you say, because that simply baffles me because that's where I think politics come into play. And someone's like, I don't think it's severe because I don't want it to hurt my candidate, which, you know, health should right. be number one across the board. That's really what bothers me the most. I mean, come on, anyone who doesn't think this is serious is not paying attention, okay? How can you live in the world we're living in no, right now not and not think this is serious? I mean, that is absurd. If that's you, right. something is wrong with you. How, how can anyone well, think this is not serious? We're divided seriously? into tribes. What's that? Right. We, 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 
we divide into tribes. Well, geez, I mean, and, even the president, I mean, the president know, acknowledges this is serious. And yet there are people right. out no, there that does. still think he it's does. not. I mean, I, who are you kidding? It just makes me mad. Well, it's, it's more serious for some age groups and some health conditions than for others. But any one of us could be a carrier, and often we're a carrier prior to knowing that we actually have the illness. So, you know, I, I think the, the group that has been of the most concern of late have been, you know, young people who are still going to the beach and, you know, having their spring flings and whatever, and not really cognizant that, you know, they, they could bring this back to a parent or a grandparent or a teacher or, you know, someone that they really love. Let me ask you this final question real quick for you, Professor. It, in the unlikely event, and I sure hope this doesn't come to be the case, we are in this same situation the way we are now. And gosh, I hope that's not the case, but I think, you know, all bets are off, so we have to acknowledge any possibility. If we're still like we are now, come election day in November, I mean, and that's an unprecedented constitutional thing. We're supposed to elect a president at that point, you know, and what could happen? Do we have any idea? How would that be addressed? Because you couldn't have an election if everyone still has to be keeping space like this, I would imagine, unless everyone votes by mail or something. What, can you imagine what would happen if we were at this place come November? We have never had an election that was delayed in the United States history. And yes, to my knowledge, we've never had an election right in the middle of a virus like we do now. But we've had, a, you know, we had them during the Civil War. We had them during World War II. My guess would be, but first, I think it's unlikely that we would have the same degree of danger in November than we do now. But if we did, my guess is that we would use a combination of voting by mail or, you know, electronically, or, you know, I could see a situation where maybe you open the polls for, you know, a longer time period. Uh, and then you, you actually maybe would, you know, schedule yourself to be at a polling booth. Uh, I. I think the worst thing we could do in a time like this would be to delay an election. You know, once you set that precedent, it's there forever. My understanding of the Constitution is we, we need to go forward. I mean, you know, I'm at MTSU. Uh, we have moved all our classes to online. And actually what I'm hearing from the student, many of the students is that they're very satisfied with this and it's working very well. If we can, if, if we can offer classes online, uh, for full-time students, surely the United States could figure out a way to, to have an election day on time. Gotcha. Well, hopefully uh, that's what will happen and it won't come to that. And uh, so I was just curious what the Constitution would dictate on that, and I agree with what you said. Professor Vile, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, usually you're sitting thank right you. next to me, but we'll do more of this by Skype in the days to come, and uh, I do appreciate you joining okay, us. Should I, should I put out my elbow here? There we go. Fist bump, I'm not sure which. <laughs> thank you, sir. You Thanks. be safe, all right? Thank you. Again, that's uh, Professor Will John do. Vile from over at uh, MTSU Political Science Professor. Look, we have one more segment left. Uh, I see we have several calls and several folks uh, making uh, some comments here on Facebook as we're streaming live on uh, Facebook at newschannel5.com. We'll take a break. I'll try to address some of that and take some of your calls in this final segment right after this.